Okay, so uh, let's get started. So this is lecture four of Computer Science 162. And what are we gonna talk about today? Today we're gonna talk about synchronization uh, and how hard it is to get synchronization. We're gonna talk about atomic operations and how they can help us or still make our life difficult with trying to, to get synchronization. And then finally we're gonna talk about locks and uh, how we can use them and some potential ways to implement them. So remember uh, the ATM bank server example. So the challenge is we have this uh, bank server and we have a bunch of ATMs uh, and they're providing requests. People want money and we need to check their balances and then if appropriate, uh, dispense money. Now we have these concurrent operations occurring because users could simultaneously be using any of these ATMs and so we need to make sure that those uh, concurrent operations do not corrupt the database. The key thing is, you know, we don't want to hand out too much money. Okay. So the challenge is, anytime we have uh, threads that are cooperating, that is they're acting on shared state, there's a risk of corruption. And we want to have threads act together because if we have threads running together, we can speed up a server. Right? So we can do key things like use a multiprocessor or multi-core uh, machine where we have one thread or multiple threads per core and we can overlap computation and I.O. Remember I.O. takes time and we don't want to sit there with our machine idle while we're waiting for something say to be read in from the disk or written to the disk. Instead we'd like to do some computation at the same time. So we have requests like you know, deposit some money in account. We want this to uh, run to completion and occasionally it might block. So for example, in this case we have to read uh, some account information and, and so that'll cause us uh, to do some uh, blocking I.O. because that might involve reading it from disk. We then here uh, increment uh, by an amount, the, the amount of the deposit, and then we're gonna store it back out to disk. And again, that might involve uh, waiting, right? Wait for the disk to, to complete our operation. We'll see later in the semester exactly why disks are uh, so slow. The problem here is if we have threads that are operating on the same account at the same time, the state could get corrupted. Right? So if uh, thread one is the monthly process that adds uh, interest to my uh, checking account and thread two is doing the electronic funds transfer of my uh, payroll from Berkeley, then what can happen? So thread one loads up the account balance, right? And then it gets context switched, interrupted in context switch, and now thread two starts running. So it loads up the account balance, adds in uh, my salary, and then saves that back out to disk. Right? Then we context switch back to thread one, we add the interest, which is a lot smaller than my salary, unfortunately, and uh, then we store it back. Okay? <coughs> And so I didn't get paid for the month. I did get my interest. Um, but this is not good, right? Our state is uh, corrupted. The key thing we have to remember is that at any time, we can context switch, right? Either because we voluntarily yield, um, with that we can control, or because we end up blocking, because we do something like disk I.O., or because we get preempted, right? Timer interrupt goes off or some other interrupt goes off, and we get preempted and now another thread runs. So the problem here is really at the lowest level, right, we can't make any assumptions about the interleavings. So here, uh, in this case, it doesn't matter what the interleavings are because we're dealing with two different variables. As long as X and Y aren't aliased to the same location, it doesn't matter whether we run thread A first or thread B first. We're gonna end up with the same result, yes. Why is it 13? I'm gonna go through that example uh, again in, in just a, a, a second. So the question is why are the possible values, how can we get 13? Okay, so if instead we do have threads that are operating on shared state, even if it is just to read that shared state, we can have a problem. So here we have two threads. First thread is uh, initially Y is set to 12, and thread A sets X to one, and then sets X equal to Y plus one. So it's reading y, incrementing it uh, by one, and, uh, or uh, adding one, I should say, to that, and storing it into x. Thread b is taking y and setting it to two. And then it's setting y equal to y times two. 
So what are the possible values that we can have? We have to look at all possible interleavings. Right? So one interleaving is we run thread A to completion, and then we run thread B to completion. Right? In which case, we'll have x equal to 1, and then x will equal y, which was set to 12, plus 1, so x equals 13. Right? So that's where 13 came from. Um, and then y uh, gets set to 2, and y uh, gets doubled, set to 4. Right? But we can have other interleavings, because preemption can occur at any time. So we could have the alternate, which is we run thread B to completion. So we set y equal to 4, then we read, uh, set x equal to 1, read the value of 4, add 1, and x equals 5. Okay. But we can also interrupt it in the middle. Okay. If we do that, then y gets set to 2, now x gets set to 1, uh, x gets set to 2 plus 1, or 3, and then y gets set to 4. Okay. Any of these interleavings can occur. If you depend on a particular interleaving always occurring, bad things will happen because the other interleavings may occasionally occur. Okay, so goals for today, we're going to go through uh, two examples that were in the, uh, in the handouts. And then uh, we're going to talk about synchronization. Uh, it's called Too Much Milk. And uh, then we're going to talk about some hardware support for synchronization. So let's look at, uh, first, our correctness requirements. So anytime we have uh, threaded programs, we want to guarantee that they work for all interleavings of any thread inter instruction sequence. Right? Now, because we have cooperating threads, that inherently means we're going to have non-determinism because we can't control the order in which those threads are going to be interleaved and when their interleavings are going to occur. So this makes it uh, both non-deterministic and non-reproducible. So it makes it very hard for you to debug uh, the behavior of a multi-threaded program unless you carefully design it. Now, for the first two projects, you're going to be using nachos. Nachos is really nice because it's a simulated environment. So if you want to make your life a little bit more interesting, you can set the uh, seed that it uses to control the timings of its operations uh, at, on the command line. Right? And you can change that seed value every time you run uh, nachos. If you do that, then you will add non-reproducibility. And so when you have a bug, it'll make it a lot harder to find that bug because the bug may show up, then you run it again, and the bug doesn't show up. Then you run it again, and the bug does show up. You change some lines, the bug doesn't show up. You run it again a little while later, and the bug shows up again. So that's what non-determinism, and especially non-reproducibility, uh, gives you. And you can play around with this. Okay, um, first example I want to talk about is the Etheric 25. So this is a machine that was designed for radiation therapy. It had two different uh, therapies it, it could uh, use. It had an electron accelerator, uh, and it could use that to generate x-rays or to generate uh, an electron beam. Okay? And uh, in the Therac 20, which was the predecessor to, predecessor to this machine, the uh, dosage was controlled and limited by hardware interlocks. Okay? But hardware is expensive. And as we all know, as computer scientists, anything you can do in hardware, well, you can do it in software, too. So they decided to remove all the hardware interlocks and controls and replace them with software controls. Ordinarily, that would have been a good idea. In this case, unfortunately, it was a very uh, bad idea. Because of multiple software errors, uh, the machine ended up uh, causing uh, several overdoses and also several uh, patient fatalities. So this is a machine that's intended to cure people, and instead uh, it was injuring and killing them because of uh, <laughs> software errors. Um, it's a really, if you haven't read the paper, I encourage you to read the paper. It might be on the midterm. Um, and uh, it, it's a really, uh, you know, very critical look at uh, what went wrong, and also the process. How did this, uh, these software bugs get introduced? And uh, it was really about around, you know, very poor software uh, design and, and practices. Now, what happened? There was a bunch of race conditions. Right? So exactly what we're going to talk about in terms of synchronization, um, and also poor software design and also poor user interface uh, design. Um, they determined that the, the data entry speed during editing was the key factor in producing the error condition. If the prescription data was en edited at a fast pace, the overdose occurred. So this is the ultimate irony. Operators who were unfamiliar with the Therac 25 
would go slowly in entering the numbers and the machine would work as intended. Operators who were very familiar with the FARAC 25 would key punch in the numbers very quickly. The race condition would cause the values to, to uh, be set incorrectly and the patient would be overdosed. And so very, uh, you, usually when you're going in for some kind of procedure, you want someone who's the most experienced sitting there operating the machine. In this case, you actually wanted the person who was completely inexperienced um, with operating the machine. But again, it's, it's, a very, it's a long paper, but it's a very interesting read. We're going to try and find a shorter version of that for, for you to read. Um, it's very important for uh, as software programmers for you to understand, especially when your code's being used in life critical, uh, life safety or, or uh, critical infrastructure uh, situations that it be, um, be done correctly. Okay, so second example I want to talk about is the space shuttle. So it's first space shuttle launch, right? This is America's return to space after Apollo. The entire world is watching it. It's on every TV channel. It's preempted uh, all the local programming. And uh, it's about to launch. Everybody's excited. And 20 minutes before the launch, the computers say, abort. And the whole world's like, wow, America, the great space power, um, can't launch this, uh, this rocket. So what happened? So the space shuttle was designed for extreme fault tolerance because this is a vehicle that's carrying you know, more than a half a dozen people up to orbit and has to keep them safe for uh, two weeks while they're on orbit and then safely return them uh, back to, to Earth. So five computers, uh, four of them running the primary aviation, avionics uh, software system, or PATS. So these four systems are uh, running, dealing with asynchronous events, so all of the monitoring information coming in from the gyroscopes and the, uh, the fl fuel flow meters and, and so on. And uh, it's real time because you have to read a value, calculate what to do, and then uh, and do something. Right, like move the actuators for uh, the gimbaled engines or something like that. Um, these computers are tightly synchronized. So every 440, uh, 440 times a second, these computers are comparing their computations. And if they disagree, we have four. So if one disagrees, we turn it off. If a second one disagrees, we turn off that one also. Now, they were very worried that there might be a logic bug that gets introduced by, uh, or software bug that gets introduced by the programmers. <coughs> so they implemented a fifth computer, the backup flight system, that was uh, similar hardware, but running entirely different software, written by a completely different software team. It's called Software Fault Tolerance. And this computer is also comparing results with the other computers 440 times uh, per second. Right, so we've got hardware fault tolerance through these four computers that are talking together very tightly. And we've got a fifth computer that's doing software fault tolerance. So the idea was uh, you know, to provide a you know, high degree of reliability and availability for the entire duration of the mission. So what happened? The countdown was aborted because the backup file, uh, backup flight system disagreed with the pass. And this was because there was a 1 in 67 chance that the pass would be out of, uh, out of sequence with the backup flight system by one cycle. And it occurred, so, so they were both running correctly, they were just off by one cycle. Right? One of these 1 in 440 times a second uh, synchronization points. What happened? Well, they made a change to the initialization uh, code of the pass. The way it worked was um, when the timer queue went empty, you look at the hardware clock and you synchronize off of that. But because someone added some code that put, in some cases, a delayed initialization request into the queue, the queue wasn't empty and so you ended up with them being slightly out of sync, one cycle. So two things went wrong here. Um, even though they had extension of simulation, the bug never showed up. That's just the way it works, right? Bugs only ever show up when the entire world is watching. They don't show up when it's a bunch of engineers sitting there watching the screen scroll by, right? And they did months of extensive testing of this software. In fact, to this date, the space shuttle software is the gold standard 
for software quality in terms of number of defects per line of code. It's only a few mo million lines of code, but it's perhaps the most tested, verified, analyzed uh, piece of code. Every change requires multiple people to agree to that uh, particular change. But these kinds of Heisen bugs are very hard to find. A Heisen bug is a bug that, you know, you run something, you get a bug. You run it again, the bug goes away. Right? So it's sort of Heisenberg principle. If you look at it, it disappears. <laughs> um, they're good and they're bad, right? The, the good thing about a Heisen bug is if you have the ability to reboot, it's going to go away. Um, unlike a Bohr bug. That's a deterministic bug you know, after Niels Bohr. Um, but a flight control system isn't exactly something you want to reboot while you're mid-flight. Right? Your rocket <coughs> goes uh, tumbling uh, out, of, out of orbit. The other problem that happened here was that this change was made late in the stage. And that makes it hard to handle and hard to test. So again, you know, coming back to this class, you know, make a major design change at, say, 11 p.m. on the night that the project is due. Right? And see what the chances are of you correctly submitting your, your code on time. Right? That's kind of what these guys were up against is, you know, a late stage change gets introduced, you can only do but so much testing. And you think this, the impact of the change is very clearly scoped. And that is another problem here, which is that w a small change can have a rippling effect uh, in a system. And again, that's something you'll probably see on the project. Okay, so yes, question? Yes, yeah, so, so the question was, you know, isn't it a good thing that the computers aborted the launch because they were in disagreement, they thought that there was a problem? Absolutely, the computers did the right thing. Just at the wrong time, a rather embarrassing time for, for America. Uh, the next law, you know, they actually debugged this, you know, if you read the paper, they, they actually figured out what happened, you know, what went wrong fairly quickly um, and, and were able to, to, uh, to meet the launch window um, for the shuttle. But... Uh, so, you know, computers behaved correctly. It's just, you know, the very public outcome wasn't necessarily what we wanted. Okay, so to try and make our lives easier, we're going to uh, talk about synchronization and how we can try to avoid having corrupted uh, data structures. So to understand a concurrent program, we need to understand what is atomic on our system and what is not atomic. What is an atomic operation? So an atomic operation is an operation that always runs to completion or not at all. It's indivisible. So once you start it, something can't come along and, and modify the state in the middle or look at the state in the middle. It either looks at the state and modifies it before or looks at the state and modifies it after. So this is really a fundamental building block. If we do not have atomic operations on our system, then we're never going to be able to, to build uh, concurrent programs that operate correctly. And we're going to start today with very low level uh, uh, atomic operations. So in particular, we're going to start with just memory references and assignments. So loads and stores being atomic. And then we'll look at higher level primitives because we're going to see how painful it is when this is all we have to deal with. Now it's very important to re uh, recognize that this is loads and stores of words, 32-bit words. Not 64-bit words, not double precision floating point stores or loads. Only 32-bit words. It's tied into the size of the computer bus. Most computers have a bus that's 32 bits, and so that's how much we can do in a bu bus trans uh, uh, transaction. We can uh, write 32 bits or we can read 32 bits. If you have a computer with a wider bus, like a mainframe, uh, might have a 256-bit bus, then you might be able to do uh, floating point uh, operations uh, as atomic uh, loads and stores. All depends. Right? But you need to know for your particular architecture what instructions are atomic and what are not. So for example, um, in a CISC instruction world, like the VAX or the IBM 360, they had instructions that would copy an entire array. That was not atomic. You could end up with very inconsistent, who knows what happens, results if you're copying an entire array and at the same time you're trying to modify uh, the values in that array. 
Okay, so some of the challenges that we're going to face. We have multiple threads op operating in parallel, and we're doing this because we want to share resources or share data. We can do either fine-grained sharing or coarse-grained sharing. So the advantage of fine-grained sharing is we increase concurrency. And increased concurrency means better performance. We get an answer faster, our programs run faster, lower latency, uh, better throughput. But it's going to make things much more complex, as we'll see. An alternative is coarse-grained sharing. Right? Much simpler to implement, but we're going to have reduced concurrency, which means lower performance. Right? So think about sharing the CPU in chunks of 10 milliseconds. Right? There's a lot of, of work we have to do to make that work, versus if we shared on one minute granularity. Sharing a one minute granularity will be easier to implement, but it's going to have much lower performance. You're going to have to wait a minute to get a hold of the CPU to run again, even if you just have two threads. Right? Add more threads, and it could take a long time before you got access to the CPU again. Also, think about sharing a database. Right? You could share it at the row level, or you could share it at the table level. You know, imagine Telebears ran with table level locking granularity. Right? So all the students on campus want to register for classes, we lock the entire table and we do it one at a time. Right? So hopefully before the semester started, you'd actually have a chance to, to sign up. Uh, I, actually, hopefully before that semester's final exam, you'd have a chance to, to sign up for uh, classes. Right? Instead, we lock at the row level. Much more complex for the database, but it means that everybody can be signing up for classes at the same time. Okay, so the example we're going to use as a motivating example is an analogy um, that uh, is drawn from the real world. And um, this is the cool thing, I think, about operating systems, right? You can take lots of things that we have as problems in the real world and abstract that into the operating system or vice versa, right? The key difference here, however, is that uh, computers are not intelligent. People are. And maybe along the way, you know, we'll learn some, some life lessons. Okay, so example we're going to use here is um, we're in lecture. Um, it's a nice warm classroom and, uh, and a nice hot day outside. And so you're, you're just thinking, you know, as soon as class ends, I'm going to go home and have a big tall glass of milk because milk does a body good. Right? So you, you go home at 3. It's not this class because we get out a lot later. And you look in the fridge, and there's no milk. Bummer. So what are you going to do? Right? You're going to go to the store and get some milk. Because right? you're really thinking, milk does the body good, I, I need to cool down. So um, you have a roommate. Your roommate has a professor who's a, a bit long-winded. And so their class runs late. So your roommate doesn't get home until you're actually arriving at the store. And they have the same exact idea of, you know, milk does the body good. Calcium is good for the bones. And they open the fridge and find there's no milk. You can see where this is going. So just as you're buying the milk, they leave for the store. Now, because this wouldn't work otherwise, you're going to take different routes coming home and <laughs> your roommate going to the store. Because obviously, as a human being, if you saw your roommate coming by with a gallon of milk, you're not going to go to the store and buy some milk. But this is not a human. This is a computer. Like I said, computers are not as smart as people. So just as you're arriving home and putting away the milk after you've poured yourself a nice tall glass of milk, your roommate is arriving at the store. And of course, they buy some milk. And then they come home, pour themselves a glass of milk, and now you've got two gallons of milk in the fridge. So that's why it's called too much milk. So let's more formally define this problem. We need some ground rules here. So synchronization is when we use atomic operation to make sure that we have cooperation between threads. Now, for the example today, the only atomic primitives we're going to have, load a word, store a word. Nothing else is atomic, which means we could be interrupted during any other operation. And you'll see. It's going to be really hard to build a system that operates correctly if all we have is atomic operations is, is just reads and writes. So second definition is a critical section. So a critical section is a piece of code that only one thread is allowed to execute at a time. 
section. So if we have a critical section, only one thread can enter it and start running. No other thread is allowed to, to enter. Finally, mutual exclusion is a way that we ensure that only one thread at a time gets to execute a critical section. So one thread being in the critical section excludes the other thread from uh, being able to execute in that critical section. Now, these are basically the same way, two, two ways of saying the same thing. Right? Mutual exclusion gives you a critical section. A critical exception gives you mutual exclusion. Some more definitions. So a lock is something that prevents someone from doing something. So one model would be you lock before you enter the critical section and before you access uh, the shared data. And then after you're done accessing the shared data, you unlock. So the last part we need is if you encounter a lock, you wait. And this is one of the core ideas of synchronization. All synchronization is going to involve some form of waiting. If someone else is in the critical section, you have to wait. All right, so we could fix the too much milk problem trivially. We put a lock on the refrigerator. You then lock it and take the key before you go to buy milk, right? Problem solved, <coughs> right? Your roommate's gonna come home, the fridge is locked, they can't buy too much milk. <laughs> but there's a bigger problem here, right? What if your roommate wanted orange juice because they don't like milk? <laughs> and there's a gallon of orange juice sitting in the fridge, right? So this is the difference between fine grain and coarse grain, right? Coarse grain definitely works, much simpler, but you're probably going to be looking for a new place to live. So not a good solution. There's another problem. I haven't told you how to make a lock. So that'll be the end of the lecture. We'll figure out <coughs> how to make a lock. So now we have some terminology. We can define the problem and design the problem. And this is the first step that you want to take. Um, there's always this impulse to just like start coding, right? So how many people here have started coding before they did their design doc on the project one, right? <laughs> yeah, you don't want to raise your hand for that one, right? That was a trick question. Um, and yet, you know, last semester I had, I had a student came to my office hours and he was like, you know, I'm going crazy. My, my project mates, they just raced ahead and, and wrote some code. And I'm like, we, you know, we need to do a design doc first, and they wrote it, and now we can't get it running, and we don't know what's going on, and you know, so don't go down that path, right? Start with a design, understand it. You'll have a much less stressful experience in this class. Um, I've had other students come back to me and say, "Wow, you know, it was so great that we did the design because we found a major bug in our in our algorithm. It was much easier finding it in the design. If we had implemented it, it probably would have taken us a long time." Uh, to find the bug. Okay, so think first, then code, retain your sanity. Okay, so <coughs> thinking first, what are our correctness properties for the too much milk problem? Well, obviously the first one is we don't want to have too much milk. So never more than one person buys milk. Right? But there's another correctness property that we want to have. Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Yeah, somebody actually buys milk. Because an easy way to solve the problem would be, uh, you know, I'm not going to buy the milk, and you're not going to buy the milk, and, you know, we're just going to have a standoff here. <laughs> um, so we want to make sure someone buys the milk. Yes, question? <laughs> um, yes, we are going to exclude the case where you buy milk and then you return milk. We don't want to buy too much milk. We have a lit you know, you guys are students, limited budget. Right? No point to buying extra milk that you don't need or is going to go bad. Um, so never more than one person buys milk, and someone buys milk if necessary. And we're going to, again, only use atomic loads and stores. We don't get to put a lock on the fridge, at least yet. So let's try our first attempt at a solution. So we're going to use a note. All right? And um, before you buy uh, milk, you're going to leave a note. All right, so that's kind of like a lock. And um, when you come back from buying milk, you're going to remove the note. And that's kind of like our unlock. 
And if there's a note, you don't buy milk. And so that's going to be our waiting. Right? So if you see there's a note on the fridge, you're going to wait until the other person comes and, and fills the fridge with milk. All right, so we're going to write a solution like this. Now remember, only reads and writes are autonomous. So if there's no milk, and if there's no note, then we leave a note, we buy milk, come back, remove the note, and we're done. So what's the result? Is this going to work? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, in the back. Exactly. We can end up with both buying milk if we interrupt at the wrong time. Okay. So let's look at that. So the problem is, in most cases, this works fine. Right? I come home, I see there's a note, and there's no milk, and I see there's a note, and I don't do anything. But occasionally, it will end up with too much milk. How does that happen? So thread A runs, and no milk, no note. Now we get interrupted. Thread B runs. There's no milk, no note. So then we go back and get interrupted. Thread A leaves a note, buys some milk, and removes the note. So, and then uh, thread B leaves a note and buys more milk. So the problem here is we can get context switched after checking for the milk and the note, but before we get to leave a note. Right. Now, clearly, if you were standing in front of the fridge, looking in the fridge, your roommate's not going to come in and look in the fridge and, you know. <laughs> okay. But this is a computer, right? and the computer is not that intelligent. So this solution is really bad. I'd argue it's made the problem worse because we think we have a solution, but occasionally it'll fail. Right? So this is going to be really hard to debug. Because you could run it a hundred times, you could run it a thousand times, and it works perfectly. And then that thousand and one time, you end up with too much milk. So we need to make sure, again, that our code works independent of any thread schedule. Whatever is illegal interleaving, has to give us the correct behavior. But maybe we have an idea here. Right? So I'm going to call this solution one and a half. Um, so the problem was we checked for milk, then we checked for note, then we left a note. So maybe the solution is just leave the note first. All right? So we're going to place a note, then do all of our checks. So that's kind of like putting the lock at a higher level. So here's our new code. All right? So we leave a note. And then if there's no milk and no note, we buy milk. And then we remove our note. So what happens in this case? You find your own note. And so what does that cause to happen? Yeah. Of course, with you, right, you wrote on the note. And you're going to see your handwriting. Plus, you know you just left the note. So, <laughs> well, you know. So with people, nothing bad. With computers, no one buys milk, right? Because it can't differentiate between the note you wrote and the note that it wrote. Right? So even worse, right? So we'll never have any milk. We failed our correctness property. All right, let's try again. So the problem here was while you can recognize your own handwriting and know that that was your note you left, the computer can't, because it's just a note. So we'll have labeled notes. That's going to be our solution. Yeah, question? So labeled notes. Now we can leave the note before we check. So the, now the algorithm is going to look like this. So in thread A, we leave new day, n note A. In thread uh, A, we then check if there's no note B, then no note, no milk, then we buy. Then when we come back, we remove note A. Thread B does something slightly different. It leaves a note B. And then if there's no note A and there's no milk, we buy milk. And then we remove note B. 
does this work? Yes, in the back. Yeah. So that's the, it's possible for neither to buy milk. Right? So you can have thread A run and leave a node A. Then you can have thread B run, leave node B, see that there is a note A, and so exit the system. And then uh, thread, before it exits, rather, and, ha and removes its note B, um, thread A runs now and sees that there's a note B. So it exits, and then we can context switch back, remove note B, and then remove note A. So this is really, really insidious. We've made the problem worse and worse, right? Because it's really unlikely that this will happen, but at the worst possible time, on the hottest day of the year, it'll happen. Right? So this is called starvation, ironically, um, because neither of you ends up getting milk. So we're still not there yet. Right? But we're getting closer. More, more and more times this works, and unfortunately, more and more insidious uh, errors crop into it. But we're getting much, much closer. Any questions? Yeah. Ah, that's a very interesting question. So the question is, you know, if we come back to our, our uh, code, what's wrong with um, just simply disabling interrupts, not allowing any context switches to happen? Anybody have any ideas what might happen then? Yes. Yeah, so what happens if, you know, this is a rather short piece of code here, but what if this is some really long piece? Like, you know, I decide to buy milk, and then I decide to go watch a movie, and then I go work on my 162 project, and, you know, and so on. Um, it could be a really long time that we end up disabling interrupts. And that would be bad if there's, like, you know, some, uh, critical things going on and we need to, to uh, service those interrupts. Like lots of network packets coming in. Those packets would get dropped eventually if we don't service the interrupts. Right? We're going to come back to this later and look at maybe how we could use interrupts, but in this kind of a, a, an environment, um, we wouldn't want to use interrupts. Yeah. Ah, so that's very interesting. Okay, so um, we could have them notice, to repeat the question, we could have them notice that they're both trying to do something at the same time and have them have some sort of default or fallback behavior. That's getting really close to our, our solution, as we'll see in a moment. So good insight. Yes. Ah, that's another good question. Given two pieces of code, you know, with given lo number of lines of code, could we determine all possible interleavings? Yes, but it's going to be exponential, and you know, testing for all of that is going to be very difficult. And especially if we add multiple threads, and we're talking about you know hundreds of thousands of lines of code, you know, it's 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 not a tractable uh, problem. So we're really going to want to get our design correct, and we're going to have the we're going to want to have the correct ideally language level synchronization primitives that mean we don't have to worry about uh, all possible interleavings. Right? If, we if we can make our, effectively our atomic operations large enough, then you know, we're looking at large blocks that have to be interleaved, and that's gonna be a lot easier to deal with than individual lines of code that might be interleaved. Another question, yes. So the question is, is there a formal way of when the operating system decides to, to do an interrupt? So an interrupt by its nature is asynchronous. So the operating system has no control over when an interrupt occurs. It could control when you service that interrupt. Uh, but the challenge is in real-time environments or in environments where you have interrupts arriving at a high rate, uh, you have to deal with them quickly. So if I have a you know, 10 gig, uh, gigabit per second link connected to my server, 
and I have traffic coming in, the, the card, a network adapter card, has a limited buffer space. And if I'm not servicing the interrupts fast enough, that buffer space is going to fill up and packets are going to get dropped. So um, you have to service interrupts as, as quickly as possible. You are allowed to disable them, but it has to be for very, very short amounts of time uh, and bounded amounts of time. Other questions? Okay, so. Okay, so a couple of administrative things. Um, section assignments, updated section assignments, I should say, have been posted to Piazza. Um, we had a little bit of challenge reading, reaching our, our fixed points because groups told us times they could meet that they couldn't meet. Fancy that. Um, but we did get everything worked out and balanced across the sections and balanced across the TAs. So attend your assigned sections uh, beginning with uh, tomorrow's uh, section and, and Wednesday's section. Um, the first project starts tomorrow. So if you haven't already, uh, take a look at the nachos walkthrough. Nachos is a lot of code. It's huge. Uh, the walkthroughs will help you understand the structure of nachos and how Nachos does uh, a number of different operations and the programming conventions for Nachos. Programming conventions are going to be critical, as we'll see in the, the later part of, of this lecture. Um, if you don't follow the programming conventions, you will run into cases where sometimes your uh, project works and sometimes it doesn't. And usually it's when we're running the test cases uh, that it won't work. Uh, so download the, the Nachos uh, tar file. Um, Start setting up your Java environment and Eclipse and Subversion or Git, depending on what you'd like to do. The TAs are going to be talking about that uh, in the sections. So very important you attend uh, sections. Um, the other very important reason why you should attend sections is that uh, we're going to have weekly quizzes in the sections. These are really more for your benefit than anything else to give you uh, continuous, immediate feedback as to how uh, you're doing in this, in this class in terms of understanding uh, the concepts. We're also going to have uh, worksheets for you to work on in, in the class, um, also to give you uh, immediate feedback on, on how you're doing in the class. As a result, we're going to be uh, slightly adjusting the grade breakdown. So 50% um, will still be from the project. The exams will go from 45% to 40%, 20 for each of the two exams, and 5% will be uh, participation. So that's coming to lecture, that's asking questions in lecture. So don't just sit here in lecture, but ask questions. Um, it's also a, uh, attending and asking questions in section. And then also asking questions on Piazza, especially those that get marked as good. So you can't just simply post empty questions. Um, and also answering questions, especially those that uh, get marked as, as good answers. Piazza gives us lots of statistics so we can see for, for each person what your uh, participation is. And then 5%, uh, as I said, from the exams now goes to the quizzes. Any questions? Yeah. No, you will not need computers for sections. These quizzes are going to be short little one-page quizzes. Um, and, uh, and I think we have like 13 sections remaining, and so uh, we're going to drop uh, like three of them. Right, so we'll only count 10, so each one will be worth uh, half a point. Yeah. Yes. Weekly, uh, this week. Weekly quizzes start this week. <laughs> and we may still have quizzes in lecture. So do remember that. Yeah. Uh, um, how are we going to quantify participation grades? Asking questions and participating in, in class. Um, we have a nice little uh, thing from Bearfax that now lets us see uh, everybody's picture. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be, and John and the TAs are going to be trying to learn everybody's name and face. So we'll know if you're here and participating. If you're uh, sleeping in the back, we'll probably also notice that. Um, the same thing for, for sections. Um, Piazza makes it a lot easier, but, you know, we're going to try our best to, to try and quantify it um, for, for section and lecture. Yes, question? Ah, that's a good question. Um, what do you guys think? Okay, so quizzes, 
We'll have material potentially for Monday lecture and, and before. Again, these are going to be very simple, mostly true, false. You know, it's really uh, are you understanding the material and intended. You know, the reason why we're only making it a five points total is because it's more feedback for you than anything else. Um, so using that, using the readings, doing the um, the uh, the questions at the end of the readings in the textbook is a good way uh, to be. Uh, prepared for the exams, or for the quizzes, rather, a and also the exams. Any other questions? Okay, so with that, we will take a uh, five minute break. Okay, so let's get started again. So we had a suggestion um, before the break that you know maybe we need to, to have these two threads realize they're trying to update the same state and maybe do something different. So let's try that as a solution. Okay, so here is a possible solution that tries to follow that idea. So in uh, thread A, if there's no, or if we leave a note A, okay, so we leave a labeled note, and while there's a note B, we do nothing. Right? We just sit there and, and spin. And then, if we find that there's no milk, we're gonna go buy milk, and then come back and remove note A. 
what does B do? So B says, uh, leave note B. And then if there's no note A, then, uh, and there's no milk, then we're going to go and buy milk. And come back, we remove note B. Right? Does this solution work? That's actually correct. So if B leaves a note, and uh, then A comes along and, and leaves a note, and then, uh, so if, we, if, we, if B leaves a note, and then A leaves a note, then B will check and see there's a note A, right? And so then if we context switch back, we'll see there's a note B. And so what will A do? It'll sit there and it'll spin. And then it, uh, B will eventually get context switched and run, and it'll remove note B. And then what happens? A notices there's not a, a note B. Right? So then A checks to see, is there milk? And there's no milk. So then A will go and buy milk. Right? And then A removes note A. So that interleaving does work. Any other thoughts? Why, why would A see that there's no milk? Because after, it, uh, after B leaves, A is then going to check to see, is there milk? And it'll find there's no milk. Because right? B didn't go buy milk because B saw no day. Yes. Right. And there's no note B now, right? So, so then there's no milk, and so A will go and buy milk. Yes? Correct. Always someone will buy the milk. So in fact, this does work, right? But sometimes it won't be B. So this is exactly what we heard, you know, proposed as a solution before uh, the lecture, right? We're going to realize that we're both, or before the break, rather, we're going to realize that we're both trying to access shared state, and then we're going to have a default behavior, right? So the default behavior is that if B finds A in the system, it exits, and if A finds B in the system, it waits to see what B does. If B buys milk, we're all good. If B doesn't buy milk, a will then go and buy milk. Right? So we can guarantee now it's either safe to go buy milk, or if it's not, the other will buy. And so it's OK to quit. Right? So at x, we know it's the case. So here, we know it's the case that if there's no note B, B's not in the system, it's safe for A to buy. Right? If B is in the system, we're going to sit and wait in A to see what B does. And again, if B buys milk, we're all set. If B doesn't buy milk, then we will buy uh, milk. At Y, what's the case? Right? So if we see A is in the system, then uh, if we see no node A, rather, then we know it's OK for B to buy. If we see A in the system, then it's OK for B to quit. Ah, so that's a good question. Are these not threads anymore because they're not sharing the same data and programs? So um, it's different programs, absolutely, or different code that's running in different threads. But they could be threads spawned by the same program. And they are accessing the same shared state, right? The shared state here is milk. Who's going to buy it? And they are accessing the same shared variable of no milk, uh, of milk rather, and testing to see is there no milk or is there milk. So they still do have shared state, but now they also have some private uh, operations that they're going to do. Yes, in the middle. Yeah. 
absolutely. Yes, this is a big problem, right? So here it's very simple. And look at all the discussion that we've had, you know, trying to think, does this really work? And I encourage you to go home tonight and think about the, all the possible interleavings and convince yourself that for all possible interleavings, it is going to behave correctly. Right? Um, and then think about what happens when you get a third roommate. And how does the code have to change? Right? You thought having another roommate was trouble enough. You know, now think about what happens when you try to make sure you don't have too much milk. Right? Um, and you'll find the code just multiplies and gets messy. Yeah, in the back. Uh, so the question is, how do we guarantee we're not going to get stuck in this uh, while loop here? Um, so eventually, the timer interrupt is going to go off, and we're going to lose our time slice, and we're going to context switch back to B. And then B will, will run to completion. Either if B was already buying milk, it'll buy milk and return. Or if it's now just entering and noticing that there's a node A, uh, then it'll do nothing, and it'll exit. And then we'll context switch back. Yes, the correct, that's correct. The safety is already there in the OS that uh, we are uh, assume, assuming preemptive uh, you know, time slicing here. And so after our time slice is expired here, we're going to context switch back to, to thread B. Yes? Ah, so does this help us buy, the question is, does this help buy us buy milk? Um, should we have an alternate scheme where uh, one roommate always buys milk? Um, so this isn't helping us buy milk faster. This is just making sure we don't end up with too much milk. Um, we could dedicate and say, you know, thread A is always going to go and, and buy uh, milk. But what happens when that thread goes away for spring break, right? Then there's no milk for that week, which might be okay. You drink something else. Um, other questions? Yes. Ooh. Yes. So this is a very good point. So the, the question is, you know, this while loop is sitting here doing nothing. So it's just wasting CPU time. And CPU time is very valuable. We don't want to just waste it. Um, so is there something better we could do? Absolutely. There are a lot of better things we could do. In fact, that's this in this class, this is prohibited. You're not allowed to do this. It's called busy waiting. We're going to talk about this in, in just a moment, um, unless, uh, unless there are other, other questions. OK, so our solution protects a critical section. Right? This critical section is that if there's no milk, buy milk. That is the thing. We want to make sure only one thread at a time is checking for milk and buying milk if necessary. Because if we have two threads trying to do this, we end up with uh, too much milk. So this solution works. Like I said, I encourage you to go home and take a look at all possible interleavings. It's a small piece of code, so you can do that. Um, but it's, it's way too complicated. Right? It's really hard for us to reason that, uh, that this is correct. And this was just a few lines of code. Right? Multiply it by you know, 100,000 and then try to make sure it's, it's correct. Um, as was pointed out, uh, we have different code running in A from what runs in B. So you know, try to think about what it would be with three roommates, four roommates, five roommates. Right? This now gets to be insanely messy. You don't want a system where adding a new thread means rewriting all of the code. It's not going to scale. It's not going to be easy to design. It's not going to be easy to, to implement. It's not going to be easy to uh, test. Um, also, as was pointed out in, in a comment, thread A is consuming CPU time while it's waiting. It's called busy waiting, and it's really bad. All right, so yes, there is a better way. We could have the hardware give us better, so higher level primitives than atomic load and store. So we, we demonstrated in this case we could do it if all you gave us was atomic load and store. But it's a completely undesirable uh, solution that we end up with. Um, even better, and we'll see later on in, in a couple of lectures, is if we have higher level programming abstraction. You put this in, the lo in, the, uh, in Java, right? Add a keyword, like synchronize, um, 
that will make it much, much easier for us to implement solutions like this. So the high level uh, picture here is um, having threads as an abstraction. Yeah, question? So now we're leaving a more complicated note. The question is, can that note fit into one word? Um, and it effectively just turns into uh, trying to implement a lock again. Because right? we need to, to check if there's a note. And uh, be able, we need to be able to leave a note, uh, check and leave a note atomically, basically. Right. So we have this nice abstraction of threads. It gives us this sequential, instruction, uh, sequential ex, uh, stream of in instructions as an execution model, which is a very nice and easy model. It allows us to overlap I.O. and computation and to have parallelism. So those are all the you know, sort of positives. But it's very complicated still to access this shared state. Right? This is just one example. We can come up with, you know, that was one solution. I'm sure there are other solutions we could come up with that are equally as complicated uh, and, and difficult to reason about in terms of correctness. And so this is the wrong level to be thinking about things. We need to think about things at a higher uh, level, right? We don't want a solution that's very tricky to implement or understand and, and thus is likely to be error prone. Worse yet, think about trying to modify that code. Right? Any modification is likely to introduce errors and not be correct. So we want to develop a synchronization toolbox and have some common programming paradigms that we're going to use. So imagine this now as our fourth solution. So let's say we had a lock, all right? Then we could, imp uh, if, and that lock had a, had, uh, a couple of different uh, operations. First operation is acquire. So you wait until the lock is free, and then you grab the lock. The second is to release the lock, and that unlocks the, the uh, lock, releasing anyone who happens to be waiting. And we're going to say that these are atomic operations. So if two threads come along and both simultaneously try to grab the lock, one will succeed and grab the lock, the other will wait. Right? Again, waiting is, is part of synchronization. So now our solution is easy. Right? We simply acquire a milk lock. If there's no milk, you buy milk, and then uh, you release the lock. <coughs> and once again, the critical section of code is between the acquire and the release. So again, we have our critical section of if no milk, buy milk. All right. So now we've just kind of you know, done the cat in the hat thing. We've just swept the problem under the rug. So now the next thing we need to implement is a lock. So how are we going to do that? So remember, a lock is something that prevents someone from accessing something. We lock before we enter the critical section before we access the, this data that's shared, when we're done accessing that shared data, we just simply unlock. Right? And if you encounter a locked lock, then you wait. Right? So again, we, we, uh, if we're going to wait a long time, we should sleep. We should not be busy waiting. So that our implementation of lock should not simply say, oh, if the lock is uh, busy, then do a while loop. Because right? that's wasting CPU. And ironically, that's also, if we only have one single CPU, that's keeping the other thread from running because we're holding the CPU and just sitting there uh, spinning. So one solution, and uh, if it can be done in hardware, some hardware designer has done it, is uh, to implement a hardware-based lock instruction. So we can ask the question, is that a good idea? Just because we have the transistors doesn't mean we need to use them for something. Um, and the problem is, think about how this would interact with the operating system. Right? So if we want this hardware lock primitive to put a task to sleep that's waiting, then it's got to have some way of talking to the scheduler to say, put this task on the wait queue. That's a pretty complicated API for an instruction to implement. Worse yet, it's tied to a particular scheduler or a particular scheduler API. So what might work really well for OS X 
might not work nearly as well for Windows. So now we've got a processor that works with Macs, but it doesn't work with Windows. Probably not a good strategy if you're uh, trying to make a general purpose processor and you're trying to stay in business. Uh, the other side of it is you know, the argument that you've heard um, over and over in, in the <coughs> lower divisions about complexity. Right? You make the hardware more complex, it's going to run slower, and it's going to be uh, more difficult to implement and uh, take up more area on the die and so be less energy efficient. So for all those reasons, even though people have in the past on processors implemented hardware lock instructions, not a good idea. Not the way we want to solve this problem. So we do have something that does allow us to prevent uh, another thread from running, and someone uh, raised it in a comment, which is enabling and disabling interrupt. So let's implement our lock doing that. All right, so remember, you know, the way that the dispatcher gets control is either because you voluntarily relinquish the CPU, it's an internal event, so you yield or you call some operation that can block, like read from the disk or, or write to the disk, or external. So an interrupt occurs, a network packet arrives, a timer interrupt goes off, all of those can cause us to have to relinquish control of the CPU. So we can avoid doing the things that would cause us to internally uh, give up control, and we can disable interrupts to prevent external events. Now we're, when we're, we're going to see later on in the semester when we talk about virtual memory that avoiding internal events gets really complicated when you have virtual memory, uh, but don't worry about that for now. Let's assume we don't have virtual memory. So we can disable interrupts and that'll cause us no longer to be preempted by an interrupt coming in, either a timer interrupt occurring or, or some other asynchronous event occurring. So a naive implementation of locks is just simply when uh, we want to acquire a lock, we disable interrupts. When we want to release the lock, we enable interrupts. So now, how can we use this? We can, uh, so the, the problem here is we can't allow this because a user could do something like this. Acquire a lock and then while true. Now, most users aren't going to implement code that does this. But as you're going to learn, your, some of your project partners might implement code that has this behavior of just going off in an infinite loop and not terminating until the auto grader kills it. Um, you laugh, but I, I promise you it's going to happen. Um, so if we allowed this kind of code, you know, what happens, right? The system goes off, you know, a user program goes off chasing wild geese, and our system effectively hangs. Even if your project partners could write good code and it didn't do this, there's no guarantee on how long that critical section might be. And if we have a real-time system, we lose all abilities to have guarantees on timing. So think about the space shuttle, right? The space shuttle gets a gyroscope update that says it's tilting over too far the wrong way. Right? And so it's got to gimbal the, the uh, rockets and adjust the, the flight control services within a really short amount of time to correct that or the problem's going to get worse. Right? If you have arbitrarily long critical sections, there's no guarantee you're going to get those interrupts that say something is going wrong in time to be able to correct it. Um, and there's lots of other kind of important events that might occur. Like if this is a reactor, you know, safety critical system, it might be saying, you know, the reactor's melting down, might be time to extract the control rods, or rather push in the control rods. And if your code's busy doing the too much milk thing, um, well, you won't need milk anymore. <laughs> so there's got to be a better implementation here, right? Instead of trying to disable interrupts for the entire critical section, let's just make acquiring and releasing the lock a critical section. So sort of a meta critical section. So we're going to have a lock variable. We're going to impose mutual exclusion on accessing and updating that lock variable. So our lock code is now going to look like this. Our lock initially starts out as free. We uh, in our acquire, we're going to disable interrupts. Now, we're going to check to see if the lock is already acquired. If someone already has the lock, then we're going to put the thread on the wait queue, we're going to go to sleep, and we're going to enable interrupts. And we're going to do all of that at the same time. Otherwise, we're going to set the lock to busy. 
We're going to acquire the lock, and then we're going to enable interrupts. Our release code is going to do something similar. It's going to disable interrupts. Then it's going to check to see, is anybody on the wait queue? If there is anyone on the wait queue, then it's going to take a thread off of the wait queue, put it on the front of the ready queue, and enable interrupts. Right? So we're basically transferring the lock to that thread that we just put on the ready queue. And then otherwise, if there's nobody waiting, we're going to set the value to free. All right. So let's discuss this. So by disabling interrupts, we're able to avoid anyone interrupting us between the check and the setting of the value. Or the check, if anybody's waiting, and releasing it. And so no one else can come in here and get into either the, to look at the value of the lock or, or to manipulate uh, the queue waiting on the lock. Only one thread at a time is going to be able to do that. Yes, question. Um, so the question is, each time we get run, taken off the, the wait queue, are we going to have to run acquire again? No, because what will happen is we're, we go to sleep here, and, and when we get woken up, we're the one holding the lock. So all we have to do is just enable interrupts, and, and we're done. Yes? Sorry, I don't follow your question. Mm -hmm. This will so the question is: Does this work for two threads? It'll work for n threads. We could have as many threads as we want, right? And we're going to guarantee that only one thread at a time is going to be able to come in and look at the lock variable and manipulate the lock variable or manipulate the wait queue, right? because in acquire, if two try to acquire. One is going to disable interrupts first. Then we can't context switch to the other one because there's no timer interrupts. And we're not going to do anything uh, unless we want to to cause a voluntary yield. Now, if we get into acquire and we find the, the lock is already held, then we are going to put ourselves on, we're going to go to sleep and re-enable interrupts. And then the other thread can now run and enter this procedure. And it's going to enter and find, again, that the lock is acquired. And so it'll put itself on the wait queue in the second position, and then it'll go to sleep and release interrupts, re-enable them. Right? Same thing over here. Only one thread's ever going to be releasing the lock because it's going to be the one holding the lock. But we want to make sure that there isn't a race condition between someone acquiring, trying to acquire the lock and put themselves on the wait queue and us checking the wait queue to make sure we can uh, wake someone up and put them over. Yes? Uh, ready queue is the queue of threads that is ready to run. So if you're on the ready queue, you can be scheduled to run at any time. If you're waiting, you can't be scheduled because you're waiting on something to happen. Right? So when you go on the ready queue, and especially if you get put at the front of the ready queue, you'll be the next thing that gets to run. So when this thread uh, gives up control, you'll then, you'll then run. Yes, you next? Ah, good question. So the question here is, um, what if we have multi-core? Um, are we disabling interrupts for everybody? So in this case, we're going to assume we have a single core, single CPU. Um, so just one thing can run at a time. It gets more complicated when you want to think about disabling interrupts across multiple cores or across multiple sockets in a multiprocessor system. Yes? Uh, so I put it at the, f the question is, why did I put it at the front of the ready queue? Because I want to make sure it's the next thing uh, that gets uh, scheduled to run. Um, we'll talk a little bit later when we talk about uh, monitors and, the, and how you transfer control and the different styles. The textbook will use this style where you get put at the front of the queue. It's a whore style and you immediately transfer control. Um, in a modern operating system, you don't have that control and that's a Mesa style. 
Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, well, we're running out of time. That's good, actually. Um, it means we're getting lots of questions. Okay, so um, we disable interrupts so that uh, we can make this a critical section and prevent two threads from acquiring the lock at the same time. Um, this is our, our, our critical section in acquire. And unlike the previous solution, the critical section is really short right? because the time it takes us to acquire or release is really small. So once we've acquired the lock, in that critical section, interrupts are enabled and we can run for as long as possible. Right? Short time, long time, doesn't matter. Interrupts are enabled. So the key thing is this allows critical interrupts to be taken uh, quickly. Now, um, where do we re-enable interrupts? This is a hard question. We could choose to re-enable interrupts before we put the thread on the wait queue. But the problem with that is that release could then check the queue and see we're not on the queue. And so we wouldn't get woken up. Right? Because release comes and runs and says, oh, nobody's waiting, uh, I'll set it to free. And then releases. And then we get to run again and we put ourselves on the wait queue and we go to sleep. Now if no one ever acquires the lock again, we'll sleep forever. If someone else acquires the lock, then they will see that we're on the wait queue. But you really don't want to write your programs assuming that. that. That would not necessarily work. Another choice would be after we put the thread on the wait queue. But now we have the problem that's even worse, right? Because release can put the thread on the ready queue, and then what do we do? We immediately go to sleep while holding the lock. This is deadlock, right? Because we're holding the lock. We're never going to run again because no one is ever going to wake us up and no one else can now acquire that lock. So we really want to put it after the sleep. But how do we do that? So the way we can do that is as follows. We know that interrupts are disabled when we call into sleep. So we can make it the responsibility of the next thread that runs to restore interrupts when it comes back from sleep. So that looks like this. So thread A disables interrupts and then goes to sleep. We have a context switch to someone else, and they return from their sleep routine, and they re-enable interrupts. Now they run for a while, and they acquire some lock and have to sleep, and so they disable interrupts. And now when we get context switched back, because we're now able to run, because the lock is now ours, we're going to re-enable interrupts also. Now this is just context switching between two threads that are sleeping. But there may be other things that are causing the threads to uh, give up control, like yield. And so we're going to have to make sure that our programming discipline for our kernel, our operating system, is that when you return from a context switch, you re-enable interrupts. Before you context switch, you disable interrupts. Now, if someone forgets to re-enable interrupts, because they add some new function to the operating system, then sometimes the code will work and sometimes the code won't work. You're going to encounter something very similar to this when you look at the nachos code of you have to make sure that you enable and disable uh, interrupts appropriately. Nachos provides some uh, functions to make it easy to figure out whether you're supposed to enable or disable interrupts. If you forget to do that, you know, your program will run sometimes, and then when we run the auto grader, it won't. Okay, so in summary, uh, we talked about a very important concept today, which is atomic operations. So again, these are operations that run to completion or not at all. They're indivisible, and this is the synchronization, uh, this is the primitive, rather, on top of which we're going to construct various types of synchronization primitives. We showed how we could construct locks using interrupts. Uh, it required very careful use of disabling interrupts and re-enabling interrupts and programming paradigms for our operating system. Um, we have to be very careful that we don't waste or tie up machine resources by spinning. Um, we also want to make sure we don't do things like disabling interrupts for very long periods of time. That's only going to cause us problems. So the key idea here is we're going to use a separate lock variable and we'll use some kind of hardware uh, mechanisms to uh, protect against modifications of that variable. 
So from now on, we're going to just keep going up the stack, adding more and more uh, sophisticated uh, primitives and not just uh, atomic loads and stores. So any questions? All right. See you on Wednesday.